After God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, God invited Moses to join him on top of a nearby mountain so they could talk. So Moses left and went to talk to God. The Israelites waited, and waited, until they felt like they had waited long enough. They found Moses' brother Aaron and said they were tired of waiting for Moses, and they were tired of waiting for God. They told Aaron to make them new gods. So Aaron asked them to take off their gold jewelry and give it to him. Aaron melted down the gold and made a golden idol that looked like a calf. Aaron presented the idol to the Israelites and told them to worship it instead of God. The Israelites offered their sacrifices to their new gods because they were tired of waiting for Moses and they were tired of waiting for God. Meanwhile, up on the mountain, the Lord was giving instructions on how to live. But he knew what was happening down below. God told Moses, Go down to the Israelites. They have forgotten that I brought them out of Egypt. They are worshiping an idol made in the shape of a calf. The Lord was angry and wanted to punish the Israelites, but Moses stood up for them. Please, don't be angry. They are making a bad choice. Let me talk to them. So the Lord sent Moses down the mountain with all of the instructions they had talked about written on two stone tablets. When Moses saw them worshiping the idol, he was so angry he threw down the stone tablets and found his brother Aaron. Aaron, why did you make this idol for these people to worship? Aaron told him that they were tired of waiting for Moses, and they were tired of waiting for God, so they made their own gods. Moses took the calf idol that Aaron had made and melted it in a fire. Then he reminded the Israelites, It wasn't a calf that brought you out of Egypt. It was God. He is the only one that deserves your worship. Moses went back to the mountaintop to ask God to forgive them for their foolish worship. Hello there. We are in a sermon series called Moses Finding God in the Journey. Now, we are all on a journey. And it's funny because many times we have this idea of where we're going to be going when you know we're growing up what what our life's going to be like what we're going to be doing but just like this moses symbol uh, logo we find ourselves kind of in a different place than we thought we were going to be but guess what that's okay god is working moses thought he was going to be the the next pharaoh instead he's this religious leader that god used in incredible ways to and still uses to this day so we are in now now week number 10 of our series We've seen Moses at the burning bush. We saw Moses say, let my people go. The people are set free. We saw them cross the Red Sea on dry land. Now we're in a phase where they're out in the desert and they are being taken care of with the manna and the quail, etc. But they're kind of in this place, this middle ground where they're not quite to the promised land, but they're also not where they used to be. And I, we can all relate to that. Now, just like you saw in that opening video, Today's message is on the golden calf, a famous Bible story. There's so much to share with you today. Really looking forward to this. So let's start in the word of God in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said, come make us gods who will go before us. And as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So he's been gone a long time. We don't know what the deal is with him. And Aaron answered, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. He took uh, what they had handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. So he made this thing. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. That's, that's it's really important. This is not even just this other God. They're saying this is Jehovah, the God, the true living God. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and they presented fellowship offerings. And afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting. Joshua was on the mountain, halfway up the mountain. So he hears the voice of the people uh, shouting, and he said to Moses, there's the sound of war in the camp. 
And Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. Moses was like, are they celebrating or worshiping? And he, Moses, took the calf the people had made and he burned it in the fire. He's not very happy here. He burned it in the fire. He ground it into powder. He scattered it on the water and he made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? And they said to me, so Aaron says, here's what they did. They made make us gods who will go before us. And as for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So he tells, tells the truth right there. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. They gave me the gold and they threw it in the fire. And I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. Well, that's not exactly how it went. But you see, the golden calf was what they worshipped in Egypt. And he, Aaron, built an altar in front of the calf. And tomorrow, there will be a festival to the Lord. So they would have known this calf idea. The, the matter of fact, the, one, of the, one of the greatest, greatest Egyptian gods is Apis. And he is uh, the symbol of the calf. And he's the god of the underworld and fertility. So they had basically said, okay, we're going to worship just like we did back in Egypt and kind of merge these ideas of Apis and the Egyptian god and Jehovah and the living god. Now, why is that so important? This is so critical because we can see this in a modern day where we've taken the things of the world and we've taken the things of God and we're merging them together, and we're, we're, we're not separated and holy unto the Lord and living our life for God completely. No, we've got this worldly stuff going on and the sinful stuff and carnal stuff, and we got the spiritual stuff going on. We're just going to blend those things together. That's what he said. He said here, uh, this will be a festival to the Lord. This is one of the most troubling verses, really, in the entire Bible. Because this wasn't just saying, all right, we're going to worship Apis now, not Jehovah. We're going to worship Apis. No, it was the merging of these things that made this so very difficult, so very ugly and so very sinful. And so we need to know that for our own lives, too. We got to make sure that we are serving God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and, and not serving the things of the world. But we are separated and really deciding to go for God with all of our heart We got to make a decision who we're going to serve. Now, if we're not careful, we can, you know, back here to this, we can have a golden calf and, and have the, tomorrow we're going to serve. And remember they said we're going to eat and drink and they rose up to be in revelry. If we're not careful, we too can do exactly that same thing. What can we do? We can uh, model instead of being made in God's image and model our life after Christ, we can make God in our image. And say, all right, God, you are who I say you are. You will do what I say you will do. And then, then I'll be accepted by you. Instead, we need to say, God, mold me and make me instead of me molding and making you. He's in charge. We're not in charge. He's the one who's laid this out. We have not been the ones who laid this out. So we got to be very careful not to merge these things. And that's the number one sin that they did. Now, check this out. See, Moses was up on the mountain spending time with God. That's what Moses was doing. And, and this is a great, this is a great uh, idea for you and I too. When we're in that presence of the Lord, this is where things are taken out of us and things are put in us. Spending time with God, that time in prayer, the time where we're reading the word of God, we're putting the word in our heart, we're singing worship songs, maybe in your car, maybe at home, or maybe as you're you know, in church. Those times spent with God are so critical. They transformed Moses and they transform us. Matter of fact, Moses was changed so drastically, his, his face was glowing and he, his beard turned white. He was transformed by the presence of God and we too are transformed by the presence of God. When we have God's presence in our life, he's, he's changing us. You know, we think about sin. There's a big contrast here between the people down beyond the mountain, at the foot of the mountain, and Moses on top of the mountain. Moses is in the presence of God. Moses is spending time with God, and God is transforming him. And then the people, they're far from God, and guess what? They're going about doing whatever they want, living a sinful life. The point being, the way to best overcome the chains of the sin in our life, the way to get freedom from those things is actually to spend time with God. 
Yes, we need to resist temptation, but the strength to resist that temptation comes with time spent with God. We're growing on the inside. We're getting stronger. And as we get stronger, we find ourselves now in a place where when temptation comes our way, we're like, no, I'm sustained by God. Moses was up there. He didn't eat or drink anything. All he needed was the presence of God. And then notice down in the valley, what are they doing? Whatever they want, sinful stuff. And then even calling that God. How very dangerous that is for all of us. Okay, look at this. Joshua, now he went up the mountain, but he never lost sight of the people. Verse 17 says, Joshua said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. Now, I, I do think that what Moses did and how Moses has uh, approached is the right approach. But Moses had a little thing, one little thing, just a little bit off. He was so close to God that he uh, really lost track of where the people were at. Oliver Wendell Holmes has a saying about being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. And if we're not careful, we can be like Moses where we're just, we just have all of our Christian friends and everything we do is Christian stuff and we lose sight of the hurting people that are around us. And Joshua actually had it right. He was halfway up the mountain. He was spending time with God. He was supporting Moses, but... He also could hear down, no, that's the sound of war in the camp. You know, Moses, Moses was like, oh, everybody's doing good. They're down there worshiping the Lord. And, and Josh was like, no, this is, this is a bad thing that's happening here. This is war. This isn't celebration. This is something, something evil is afoot. And so you and I need the same spirit. We've got to make sure we take the things from God in the presence of God, but we don't lose sight of the hurting people that are around us. This is especially dangerous for me as a pastor. I can easily do this where I'm surrounded by such great Christian people that I don't realize the pain of sin, the destructiveness of sin in the, in the hearts and lives of people uh, in everyday life. That's why we got to have one hand down and one hand up. One hand up the mountain, one hand down, taking what God's got and putting it in people's hearts. Jesus himself was very good at this. He would spend time with God, but he always had his hand on the people where they were really at. And Joshua here is our model for that as well. This week, we're kicking off something called Love Our City. This would be a great opportunity for you and me to take a step out of our comfort zone and, and reach and help some people that are hurting, some people that need Jesus, having some conversations with some people that we probably wouldn't have conversations with, asking them, where are you at? How can I help you? How can I pray for you? If I'm just here to listen. Just tell me where you're at right now. And I tell you what, when we do that, people will talk when we have a real spiritual listening ear. Okay, so now we went through Moses, and now we went through Joshua. Now, Aaron was a people pleaser who shirked his responsibility. It's pretty harsh. Verse 24, they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Two things I want to share here. Of course, Aaron himself, that's the people pleaser spirit, so, so destructive. And then he also had a responsibility to make sure all the people were serving God and he did not fulfill that responsibility. So this people pleasing spirit, very dangerous, very dangerous. When we have this people pleasing spirit, we care more about what they think than what God thinks. We care more about what other people and their opinions are than we care about God and his opinions. And we have to make sure that God's opinion rules over our opinions and other people's opinions. And what God thinks about what we're doing is much more important than what other people think. And this is the bridge we all got to cross. Every one of us. Some point in time, they'll be making fun of Christians. Are we going to stand up for God? Or someone says something against the things of God or the word of God. We're going to stand up for Jesus. We're going to take a stand. Aaron here, the people came to him. They said, oh, we don't know about this Moses guy. We haven't heard. We got to, haven't got a text from him in a long time. Who knows what he's up to? We, you know, 40 days up there or something. Let's go ahead and do this. And then instead of Aaron saying, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to be serving the Lord. And, and Joshua later says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's that's the spirit of Joshua. And Aaron's spirit is, I'm just going to go with the flow. Whatever everybody wants is what I'll give them. Now, today's the day to take a stand. Every one of us take a stand and say, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to serve God completely. 
And Moses wanted to know, all right, Aaron, you got this people-pleasing spirit on your life and you're shirking your responsibilities. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And notice what he says. Well, uh, out came this, this calf. It was like, it was like a calf-creating miracle. <laughs> and Moses was like, did they threaten you? Did they, were they coming after you? No, no, they just, they just had this stuff and they gave it to me and I tossed in the gold and out came a calf. Well, actually, verse 4 said that he fashioned it with a tool. So in other words, Aaron's lying here. He needs to man up about his situation, man up that he made a mistake, and say, you know what, I don't know, I was, I was a, a people pleaser. And, but you know to see the people pleasing spirit is still in Aaron. You could tell that by the way he talks about uh, the situation right here. Even to Moses, he's like trying to just shirk his responsibilities. It wasn't my fault. I mean, it's these people. He's playing the blame game. Guys, on a personal level, we got to make sure we don't have a people-pleasing spirit and that we take a stand and we take the responsibility for the situations that we find ourselves in. So now we've done Moses, we've done Joshua, and we've done now Aaron, but let's talk about the people. See, the Israelites got impatient and stopped trusting God. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, the, the real kicker here is the impatience that the Israelites had. This was the motivation for all of this. They thought, well, we're in the desert here. We don't know what's going on. It's been 40 days. Let's just go ahead and do this thing ourselves instead of trusting God. That's what they should have been doing. They should have been actually trusting God putting their faith in the Lord, saying, okay, God, we don't know what happened to Aaron, but we are going to continue to serve you no matter what happened to Aaron. He might, be, he might have died in that lightning up there. We don't know what's going on on top of that mountain. But as for us, we're going to keep on this path and stay on this path. Guys, it's so easy to have an impatience come over our lives in difficult times instead of pushing through and trusting God. Now, there's something special here about the 40 days. Okay. If you look at it, 40 days is a, is a time that, that really has uh, lots of biblical significance. Um, Moses, here on the mountain, 40 days. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel laid on his side for 40 days. Elijah fasted for 40 days. Jesus was in the wilderness and fasted and prayed for 40 days. Uh, Jesus' um, time between his resurrection and his ascension was 40 days. So we, and there's even other ones. The, the flood, the flood was 40 days. Why 40 days? 40 days in the, in the context of the Bible always represents a spiritual challenge. Always. It's a challenging thing. It's a difficult thing. A spiritual challenge. And what do we need to do in the times of our spiritual challenge? We have to push through and resist the spirit of impatience and trust God, lean on God to supply for us. Here in this story, the Israelites needed to be stronger in their own spiritual life. They weren't strong in their own. As soon as Moses wasn't there, they completely fell apart. Guys, this, this, this happens sometimes in our Christian lives too. If, if the pastor is not totally taking care of you all the time and not doting on you 24-7, do you have your own spiritual life, your own spiritual uh, heart for God, depth in God, relationship with God? Or as soon as someone makes a mistake, are we just blown into pieces and, and flitter, flitting away? No, we got to be rooted, grounded on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Another thing about these Israelites. See, Moses wanted them to ingest the reality of what they had done. Then Moses grounded into powder, scattered on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He took the... Moses takes the golden calf, beats it into a powder, I don't know how long that took, and made the Israelites drink it, ingesting the reality of what they had done. Now this is a difficult thing to talk about, really, guys. But there are consequences to the situations we're in, the mistakes we make. There are consequences. Now our culture doesn't like consequences. They want, we want a consequence-free culture that we can do whatever we want and there's no consequences to our actions. Well, that's just not how life works. Moses wanted them to realize the gravity of the mistake they had made. They had made a grave sin before God. 
And Moses wanted them to get it, understand it. So what did he do? He made them ingest it, put it in them. It's easy for us when we make a mistake and we sin. I know I've done this, where I try to get past the feeling or the conviction of that sin just as quickly as possible, just trying to get past that conviction so I can feel better and feel relieved and feel the freedom of forgiveness. Sometimes, guys, we got to make sure that we, yes, we're forgiven. We'll talk about that in a second, but we got to make sure that we ingest the reality of what we've done. Because if we don't properly realize what, what, what's happened, we're going to make the same mistake again. We're going to do it again because our eyes have not been opened to what's really happened or happening. So you and I, we've got to ingest it. We've got to realize it. Now, yes, there, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Yes, there's forgiveness for you and for me. Forgiveness is found in Christ no matter what you've done, no matter what level of sin you've committed. Yes, you can find Christ and he will forgive you. It's a promise. But let's not move so quickly past the conviction phase that we don't understand the gravity of what we've done. If you hurt someone else and you sin against them in such a, a deep way, we've got to take time and realize, I really hurt you. I'm really sorry about that. Not just say, oh, I'm sorry. It's no big deal. Just, just get over it already. I said I was sorry. See, we don't understand the gravity. We've not ingested the reality of the, rea of, of the situation that we're in. Okay, one more thought here. Resist the familiarity of Egypt and trust God in the desert. The familiarity of Egypt versus trusting God. And we'll go back to this slide here in just a second, but let's talk about that. I found, and you probably realize too, many of us will gravitate towards what is familiar to us instead of the adventure that God's got for us and trusting God in that space. All through this series, we have seen the children of Israel keep talking about going back to Egypt. They, 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 we just need to go back. We just need to go back. This is, this is the gods that, that took us out of Egypt. Now let's go back to Egypt. They were just constantly gravitating back and, and, and wanted to go back to that place where they once were. Now that's slavery in Egypt. It was horrible. They were working nonstop. They were owned by someone else. They were raped. They were tortured. That's what was happening back in Egypt. But you know, sadly, all of that atrocity, yet they knew what was going to happen and they would rather pick the, uh, the atrocious situation that they were in because they were familiar with it than take a step out in the desert where you don't have anything if God doesn't provide it, a step of faith, a step of adventure with God, saying, all right, God, I don't have anything else, but I've got you, and that's enough. Many, many of us will stay gravitating towards Egypt, even though it's awful, instead of the possibility of God bringing us to the promised land. We have got to break that spirit off our lives. You and me, breaking out, spirit of faith, believing God, He's going to do something. He's working in our lives. Yeah, we, we are not uh, where we quite need to be yet, but God is doing something in us and through us. And as he's doing that, guys, we're taking steps of faith. Now back to this slide. I got this uh, tightrope walker here. That is what God's calling us to do. No net, no safety net below us, just a uh, guy walking across on a tightrope, this is how God's called us to, to live. Now, those tightrope walkers, they have to focus on where they're going. They're really not looking at their feet. They're focused on where they're headed. We got to be focused on where we're headed, just taking one step in front of the other steps, saying, all right, God, I trust you. It's dangerous, but I trust you. That's what God's called us to do. That's, who, that's what God's called us to be. For my own life, I find this very difficult sometimes. This story really has been speaking to me as, we, as I've been studying it because it's very easy for me to people please and be like Aaron and say, well, this is what people want, so let's just give them what they want. It's also easy for me to be like Moses where I'm, where I'm so spiritually minded or heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good and I don't quite realize what people are going through around me. It's easy for me to be like the people who are uh, 
familiar with Egypt and, and get, I get in this place of comfort and I get in this place where I'm sitting here in my, what I understand instead of God saying, all right, take this step. It's easy for me to be impatient because I got to trust the Lord and say, all right, God, this is your church. You'll do it in your timing. You'll do it in the way you decide to do it, not the way I decide for it to be done. And I trust you in it, Lord. I'm just shaking off that impatience. So I don't know about you, but I can relate to all the different characters in the story, and maybe you can too. So how do we apply this to our lives? Spend time with God every day. Be patient in the midst of, your, uh, of challenges, and then own it when you make a mistake, and then humbly come to God for forgiveness. Let's break these down a little slower. Right here, spend time with God every day. This is so critical that you and I have time in the Word and time in prayer. It's the only way we're going to have the strength that we need to overcome the temptations in our life. We have got to, to root ourselves in our personal relationship with God. If the Israelites would have done this, they wouldn't have committed the golden calf sin. Number two, be patient in the midst of the challenges. Spiritual challenges last 40 days. Push on through. Maybe you're in a spiritual challenge right now. Push on through. Number three, own it. When you make a mistake, own it up. All right, don't, don't just get past it. Say, this was me. This was on me. Aaron should have done this. He didn't do this. But the, 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 the lesson could be learned for us to do just that. We own it. All right, God, I made a mistake, but I'm coming to you in humble, in humble circumstances asking for forgiveness. And we ask for that forgiveness with the understanding that we've owned the situation. So let's have a moment of prayer here together. God, we come before you with humble hearts. Lord, we want to be like Moses who, have, who, who, who has this deep personal relationship with you, Lord. That is the cry of our hearts, to know you, God, for you to be the one who sustains us all the 40 days, Lord. And help us to have that same spirit, a spirit of Joshua, who is, Lord, reaching up and spending time with you, but also aware of the situations of the people around us. Help us to be aware of the hurts and the pains and the spiritual um, uh, sins, even in the hearts of the people around us so we can help them and we can help them take steps closer to you. And Lord, we want to be more patient. Help us, God, to be more patient. That Lord, when we're in the middle of a spiritual challenge, we push through we don't look to other things, but we push through and we seek you. And God, give us that spirit of faith as we're walking this tightrope together. We're just taking steps of faith. Help us all, Lord, to uh, put our focus on you, look towards you, take one step at a time so we can get to where you called us to be. We pray all of this in the precious, mighty name of Jesus. Amen.